Hi there, global citizens. Welcome back to the podcast that inspires a borderless mindset around manifesting a new world. I am your host, Florence Adu, and I am sitting in my newly opened courtyard, which has been many years in the making, but I'm very happy to be sitting outside on a not so cloudy, a little bit overcast, um, Brooklyn Sunday afternoon. And I'm really excited to be speaking with my guest today because she, I met by chance, very by chance. (laughs) I was out for a ride on the Brooklyn streets and I passed by an organization called Art Shack. And just curious, looked inside, um, was just gonna window shop and, and she saw me and said, come on in. And so I parked the bike and went on in and I'm very, very, very happy that I did. So my guest is a ceramic sculptor an art therapist and licensed educator specializing in children with special needs and so, 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 so much more. Beverly Watson, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. Great, 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 great. So let's jump right in. Where are you from? I was born in the island of Jamaica. Okay. Kingston, Jamaica, the city of Jamaica. Okay. And where are you local? I'm local in bed Brooklyn, New York. Okay. And what is your craft? My craft is ceramic sculpture. It, I actually paint as well and do other mediums, but that's my joy. That's my heartbeat. That's what I, in, I feel most empowered doing, mm. ceramic sculpture. Okay. So tell us a little bit more. How did you, how, did, how do you go from or, or marry the two sides of you? You're an educator and you're a sculptor. So let's start with where you came to, how you got into art. How did you develop your art craft? Well, actually, my first interest or connection to art was there was a very big rock or wall in the back of my house as a child, like a sheer cliff. And my house stood on the base of that. And as you looked at the wall, you would see layers of different kinds of soil. And as a child, I was fascinated with the layers. They were in beige and creams and striations of orange colors going through. And I would dig it out. I had the desire to dig this out. And I noticed that the texture was very chewy and soft. Did you not taste quite. It? I didn't taste it. I, you know, it's, I, I was smart enough not to taste it. But it was actually very interesting. And I, and I was fascinated by this texture in my hand. And I would spend days playing with it. And, you know, as years went on, I never touched clay again. Mm-hmm. Until I was about 18 and wanted to go to college to mm-hmm. do art. Mm-hmm. And so I attended Jamaica School of Art in Jamaica okay. for one year. And where is that? That is in Kingston, Jamaica. At that time, it was the only art program that they had on a college level in the Caribbean islands. So many other colleagues from Mm. other parts of the island would come to Jamaica School of Art Mm -hmm. to learn to be artistic. So I did that and I got a scholarship or an offer to attend Pratt Institute Ah, in New York. So I transferred from Jamaica School of Art to Pratt Institute where I completed my undergrad degree in ceramic sculpture. Okay. And so for my listeners, Pratt is a very well-known school here in Brooklyn. It's not, it's a few blocks from where we are right now. Beautiful campus with many sculptors, sculptures in the garden. So, so how was your experience coming? So you came to Pratt at a, probably an interesting, how was your experience? Like that was your first experience in the U.S. How did you acclimate yourself? Well, honestly, when I came, I did, even though I was transferred here, I didn't have the opportunity to begin right away. It actually took maybe two years or three years from the time I arrived to do that. I worked in the community. I worked in the city doing things. I was skilled as a stenographer. So I didn't even work in my field. I did that. I worked to save enough money to help me with the process of furthering my education providing me with accommodation. My parents were not here. I was here by myself. Yeah. And so there were some things I had to put in place to make that happen. Sure. And so when I went to Pratt, it was just a whole new world. It was so different from the school of art that I attended. Yeah. Not necessarily better or worse, just different. Yeah. And um, living on campus at one point in a dorm was also foreign for me. 
But it was really exciting. It was a time when everybody was so aware of their culture and their roots. And, you know, everyone was so proud of who they were mm -hmm. and playing drums on campus and taking dance classes and all this Afrocentric awareness and love of self and, and communicating with people of diverse cultures mm -hmm. and getting to know different people mm -hmm. was really a wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As well as learning about discrimination that was new to me in this right, culture. Right, right. So that was, that was kind of what I was yeah. hitting on because... Yeah. I know Pratt to be very diverse, actually. You know, when I go around the campus, I see a lot of, you know, students from many cultures. I don't see many Blacks. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I don't know if that's something that they are trying to address and have been trying to address for many years. But I do know of quite a few um, Black people that have attended. So so how was that, like, coming, com okay. coming from a culture that you are the majority and then as an artist, because that's a whole other... You know, space. This is interesting. Mm -hmm. Do you really want me to talk about this? I do. <laughs> so I here do. it is. So um, racism was not something I was familiar with from my country. There were other kinds of disparities between cultures or caste systems and things like that. But not liking you or treating you with respect because of the color of your skin was new to me. Yeah. It was such a foreign experience and, and really shocking. However, at Pratt, at the time that I went there, which was in the 80s, there was a diverse and a large population of African-American people there. Okay. They had the, di um, the dietitian department, they mm -hmm. had the architectural department, mm -hmm. and then they had the different kinds of arts departments. There were lots of African-American black people from all over the world sure. who were there. Mm -hmm. So I didn't feel that I was alone. I could align myself with people like myself. There were some people from my country who had transferred here. Okay. They started the year before. I was welcomed and received by them. So I didn't feel um, cut off or alone or ostracized. I had support system that could prepare me for what was to come. Sure. sure. So that made my experience a little more bearable. Okay. Okay. In the midst of the confusion. Also, I came from a culture where education, like all cultures, is important. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times, the countries that are third world or considered third world is considered uneducated. Mm -hmm. And the standard of education in Jamaica is very high. Yes. So when I, I got here and I did certain um, courses like history or some liberal arts subject, I remember once a professor telling me that I plagiarized because he did not believe I was capable wow. of writing the paper. And because yeah. I came from a culture where you show respect to elders and teachers, mm -hmm. I didn't know how to use my voice mm -hmm. to say to him, no, I wrote it. I did say it, but he did not believe me. And so he gave me a C for an A paper because he didn't feel I had the ability as a black child, a black student, to write a paper like that. Wow. So those were some of my experiences. Wow, 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 wow. That's a, not surprising, quite amazing. But you persevered. I persevered. Yeah. I was determined to complete what I started. Sure. So regardless of whatever happened, I was really tunnel vision on what my goal was, which was to graduate. Having an opportunity to come to another country mm -hmm. to get my education was something that did not happen to any of my six other siblings who were left okay. home. Okay. And so I had to take advantage of that honor and that opportunity. Sure, sure, sure. Well done. <laughs> okay, so you've graduated from Pratt. Mm -hmm. You are now deciding where your career is gonna take you. Yeah. So what was first? What did you do first? The first thing I did was try to find a job. And I realized that I still had this stenography skill, so I did a little bit of that. But then I realized that I was qualified to work as a teacher, to mm. you know, get a position as a teacher. I really wanted to work in the field of art, but I didn't have the resources or the support to direct me in the path of how to pursue my creative aspect, my self as an artist uh -huh. or the career as an artist. Sure. So I had to find a way to survive. Okay. At this point, when I graduated, I had just gotten married. I was about to have my first son. So mm -hmm. having somewhere to live and to have an income was a priority. Right. And I realized that the Board of Ed was had a shortage of teachers and they were willing to hire us without the masters with the understanding that we'd go back to college and work for the next five years on pursuing that. Okay. And so I took that opportunity. So I started okay. off as an educator in the public school system. Okay. 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 And what subjects did you teach then? I taught the gifted and talented, ah, specializing in English. Okay. But I also have some training in dance. Um, I actually pursued that in college in Jamaica as well. I did a year okay. there as well. Okay. So, and that was a great passion of mine, a great love of mine. Yeah. And so I did that as an elective to the children. 
Okay. And so that's, yeah. Okay. So it's my, anything that was creative, I had a pleasure in doing. Nice. Nice, nice. Okay, so you are an educator for many years. You're deciding and, and you're enjoying it, I'm assuming. Yes. So yes. then how did you get back into the artist that you are? What As time went you? on, I shifted from doing different levels of subject areas. As a teacher, I taught the gifted and talented in middle school. I taught special needs kids. And I particularly chose the special education department um, a couple years after that because I was pursuing my master's degree in art therapy as well as special ed. Mm -hmm. So it was a double master's that I was pursuing at Pratt at the time. Mm -hmm. And so I needed to work with a population that I could learn with mm -hmm. and learn from. So mm -hmm. I went into the field of special education. I pursued that, but everything I taught was through the creative process, mm -hmm. teaching the children to draw. I, it was just so wonderful mm -hmm. to pull the gifts from the children, to yeah. have them really find themselves through the art. Right. And whatever medium was available right. or accessible, we'd do that. Right. I was big on exploring nature and the environment, um, color and movement. And so I incorporated that in the curriculum whenever I was allowed to or was able to do that, had right. the flexibility to do that. Right, right. So it's interesting you say whenever you were allowed to. Of course. Because we're finding that arts programs are being cut like exactly. right, throughout, the, throughout the city, throughout the, the states, throughout yeah. the, the world, I think. Yeah. You know, I think there is definitely, there are definitely, you know, either you go to a specialized art school mm -hmm. or you have to go to some program, but as a standard offering in schools, you're getting less and less of that. That is true. So how do you see arts re-emerging, coming back? What are some of the policy implications or, or things that people, families can do to start to see that come back into like the fold of everyday education? I mean, I have to say personally, art was one of my favorite subjects. And I can't remember a year that I didn't have some kind of major art product yeah just in school and so now I see my you know my friends children and you know it's sometimes they have art sometimes they don't so, yeah. so how do you see some that transitioning into well it's interesting that you'd say that because I'll start by saying that when I was in Jamaica even though I loved art yeah. it was not explored in the same way maybe because we were in nature and we yeah. took it for granted and that alone the sun rising and setting the ocean the you know the water the rivers was a part of our whole experience mm. so we were around art we lived art we're mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. it's more concrete sure it's more Sure. structured buildings elevated and not that large space with a big horizon, sure. at least in, in the city yeah. where I am. Yeah. So in the public school at the time, you were not even valued as an art teacher, really. I mean, mm -hmm. if you were a math teacher or a science teacher, that is what the society said was important. Mm -hmm. So an art teacher was not even accredited the way they deserve. They went to college, got the same degrees, the same mm -hmm. license, but it was not accredited. Mm -hmm. So there was a disconnect in terms of understanding the importance yeah. of the arts. Yeah. How is how does that translate now? I'm seeing more of that happening in the schools. When there are budget cuts, they cut the art. Yeah. It is considered not that important. Art is so important. Yeah. The expression of your spirit and yourself is so important. Mm -hmm. To be able to look at the sky and, 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 and breathe the air and feel the air on your skin and look at the leaves and the sun glistening through it is all a part of nature and a part of the experience of creativity. Mm -hmm. And children should be allowed to have the opportunity to go outdoors, to enjoy that experience, to recognize that that's all a part of nature mm -hmm. and to use their hands mm -hmm. to touch and feel and create in any way that will allow them to be empowered mm -hmm. and to grow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I believe that it's coming back. There was a phase where it phased, phased out a sure. little bit and I, I see a lot more programs, for example, Art Shack, for example. Okay. The programs that they're having there, which should only be on ceramics and clay, it's not. They're having programs where children are learning to paint and draw and mm -hmm. color. And, you know, they have murals being built by people in the community, mm -hmm. um, diverse people coming together mm -hmm. to have the opportunity to allow self-expression and to allow children to express themselves, right. not just adults. Well, that's good news. Yeah. That's good to hear. I can say that in my Ghana life, mm -hmm. and it's interesting because you say it is, it's the same because it's not, it's not emphasized, you know, yeah. I don't, I don't know, but, but we have an art of, of a burgeoning arts culture and arts That's right. sector and, and, you know, many people are stepping outside of themselves to be, you know, taking that risk to be artists because mm -hmm. I think similarly to growing up in Jamaica, growing up, you know, as a, oh, I want to say 
we're called, we're now the global majority. <laughs> we people of color. <laughs> I mean, I've always we, known that. Yes. I've always not said, why are they calling us minor? Right, but anyway, exactly. Yeah. So those of the global majority have always taken for granted, or not granted, it's taken for fact that you have to have some hard skill. You yeah. have to be an engineer. Yes. You have to be a, a doctor. And I've said that many times. Mm-hmm. And so to find more children stepping outside of that box and, and young people stepping outside of that box is very encouraging because yeah. I often talk to people who are adults and they, they often say, I wish yeah. that I would have. Yeah. And so in your yeah. case, you, you didn't just wish. Yeah. You did. I did it. Okay. So tell us, so we, you, this educator, you have these specialized skills. So how have you been expressing your art as a sculptor? Well, you know, it's interesting. And I must say before I go any further to address that, Mm -hmm. that I have four beautiful children who are adults now, Uh and they've always been in the arts. Ah. And they've specialized in dance, they've performed all over the world in different venues, and some have continued to pursue that, and others have decided to do other things. But the creative process in their life has shaped them. So with that being said, this exhibit that you saw was the first exhibit in 30 years. I put it on pause as a single parent to raise four children in bed style, three of whom were sons. Wow, wow. Okay, so my time was consumed with making sure, I call them my living sculptures. Mm. That was my consolation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I I, I love creating with my hands so much that I get so much in a zen and a zone that I tune everything out and I did not know how, I honestly did not know how to do both. To be that active, involved parent and yeah. also be the artist that I needed to be. Okay. And, but I was never sad about it. I translated my art in interior decorating, teaching mm-hmm. art to children, mm-hmm. getting an alliance with Pratt to get access to clay, to bring it to the public school, to work with students there, to teach them how to sculpt and paint and draw. Mm-hmm. I um, became an art teacher because I'm licensed as an art teacher as well. Mm-hmm. So I was able to teach the creative process to children who would needed to have a portfolio prepared to go to middle school. Mm-hmm. That has changed also. They no longer accept the children just by the art, but they have to have a certain academic standard. Mm-hmm. So the kids who were actually really talented mm-hmm. missed out on the opportunity to get into certain schools at that time because they changed the rules. Oh, wow. That you must have a certain score. And I'm not saying that's not important, sure. but there are some children who communicate Yes. and express themselves and show their gift through that. Right. And it has to come for something. Right, 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 right. So that's another of those. So now in terms of sculpture, mm-hmm. my garden is my sculpture. My okay. house is my sculpture. Okay. Everything in it is a creative process. Okay. Uh, but the need and the passion to get back to sculpting is something that I feel has been almost like a missing link in my spirit and my soul. Okay. And nothing, no one stopped me. I just got caught up with life. Sure. And the process of living. Sure. And I, one day I said, it's time. Mm-hmm. It's time. My sons and daughters are adults. I have grandchildren who have never seen me create. Mm. Okay. My kids were young hoofers. So the whole creative process in my life, my daughter danced. She performed in Ghana, yeah. in the Ivory Coast, not Ghana, the Ivory Coast. The okay. teachers were all African teachers yeah. who taught them dance, but they did Bali and everything else. So that was my life. It just oh, getting them were, out there. You were a stage mom. I was a stage mom. Oh my, my goodness. My son performed in Germany okay. as a tap dancer. Okay. I went to Germany with him, put him in school for a while, right. made sure he was safe and stable. Sure. You know, they, they have branched off in different things in their life, but I was that kind of mom. So I, there was, you know, it was. Wow. Oh my goodness. They were all, all four of them were performers. performers. Okay. They went to the Restoration Dance Theater. They grew up okay. there. We had a large community okay. of African-American children who were taught to dance. They were part of Dance Africa. They performed with Chuck Davis at the time. Yeah. They spent their whole life on stage performing. Sure. Sure. There was a group of young African... There was a time tap dance was rooted in um, from slavery yeah. where they couldn't beat the drums, so they put bottle caps on the back of their shoes right. to make the rhythm. Sure. So they were called hoofers. My sons were hoofers. hoofers. Oh, wow. So they were like the young hoofers. We call them the... And they performed everywhere as oh, young wow. hoofers. Okay. And so that's what my time was spent doing. Okay. Well, well done again. So before we move on, let me, let me just ask you, you traveled around with your children, and I'm sure you've traveled the world. Let me ask you my Global Speak question. We want to know what you hear. So I ask you to share a word, a phrase, or a saying that is uh, a meaningful part of your local experience and why or how you came to value it as a global speak. 
The phrase that I would use is no problem, man. Okay. okay. No, problem, man. <laughs> no problem, man. And that's a typical um, phrase that we use in Jamaica, yeah. meaning that we don't stress over stuff. Yeah. We don't allow ourselves to get broken down by the situations that we might come across. Mm -hmm. If we just take it easy and relax and just adjust to the process or mm -hmm. not just adjust, the word is not adjust, but to understand that everything is a process mm -hmm. and we don't have to take it that seriously mm -hmm. to make, to, to get out of that space of calm and being centered. Mm -hmm. Don't make it a problem. Don't make every situation a problem. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean it doesn't have to be addressed sure. or you're pretending it doesn't exist, sure. but you're not going to make it such a problem that it takes you outside of yourself, yeah. of who you are and who you are to become. Yeah, that's great. That's a good one. No problem. No problem, man. No problem. Okay, good. All right. So let's talk about your Art Shack residency. Okay. Yeah. So. So how did it come about? How did, how did it all? It was just so funny. Uh -huh. um, this was maybe two years ago. I started driving around and looking for and thinking about places where I want to start creating. I knew I was ready to start that process of getting back into the clay. It was just a hunger, yeah. uh, an insatiable hunger. It was time. And I felt ready. And I said to myself, why is it it took me so long to get back? And I said, it's not anybody's fault. I just was not there for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. But now is the right time. Mm -hmm. And so I, I looked at a couple of other places that um, provided studios for art. Mm -hmm. But the one that I liked the most was Art Shack. Okay. There was nothing special at the time why I chose Art Shack, other than it had the available location, sure. which was in Bed-Stuy. Yeah. It was next to the YMCA, of which I was a member since 1995. Mm -hmm. I swim over there. I thought it would be nice to do, find a studio that I could work in, and wow, go next door and swim. So it was really initially just a convenience. But when I became a member, it, it meant that I could have access to the studio 24-7. Mm -hmm. I could go in at any time. And I work very long hours in the field that I'm doing now, which yeah. is working with children with autism. And so when I am done, it's like 8, 9 o'clock at night, and I would go to the studio and just have this quiet, peaceful moment mm -hmm. where I'm by myself mm -hmm. or maybe one other person. Mm -hmm. But they are by themselves. We are all in our own space. Yeah. But usually I'm by myself, yeah. and I'm just exploring the feel of clay again. Okay. And I'm teaching myself the love of the texture between my fingers and the roll of it under the palm of my hands mm -hmm. and squeezing it. Just as I teach children to play with Play-Doh, yeah. here I am having this adult experience that I've taught other children. And it was wonderful. Yeah. And then I decided I'm going to start making a few masks. Let me just start with that. Mm -hmm. I'm capable of doing more, but let me just see what it feels like with that. And I, it wasn't every day, even though I had a membership and I paid for the month, I may have gone two or three times in a month until COVID happened. Mm. And, and then the availability of time became accessible to me. And so I went more frequently. Okay. And again, when I'm working, I'm in this zone where energies flow through me. It feels like energies flow through me. This happy, wonderful, empowered energy. And myself and the spirit that is working with me is one. Or maybe more than one spirit. Yeah. I don't know how to explain yeah. it, but it feels great. Sure. And as I make the pieces and I look at one piece, I'm like, wow, did I do that? I mean, literally, did I do that? Because I didn't pre-draw it or pre-decide what it was going to be. Just My flowed. hands started to carve. And, and it's, wow. I'm, I'm just really having a joy expressing that to you now. Yeah. And so that's how it began. Okay. And so at Art Shack, they usually... There are some sculptures there, but the majority work on the wheel, yeah. creating beautiful vessels, beautiful cups and plates and um, candle holders, just wonderful mm -hmm. art mm -hmm. from a wide range of um, diverse people. Yeah. But mine was heavier and thicker, and I had to relearn and reteach myself which clay was best for the kind of work I was doing. Mm -hmm. it, it's some of smooth and maybe my needed grog, which is a like sand. It's mm -hmm. not sand, but it's mm -hmm. like sand mm -hmm. that I had to incorporate in it. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I'm learning all over again, like a child, mm -hmm. but I don't have a teacher. I'm teaching myself. Sure. And the experience at Art Shack was that I saw other um, members creating and I felt comfortable asking them, what did you use? Or why did you do that? Or how do you do this? Or, yeah. you know, ask for suggestions. And they were so willing, they were so open to talk and to share mm -hmm. and to support mm -hmm. that I said, this is home, this place, I have found a place that's home at Archer. Nice. And, uh, but I continued to work privately and by myself. 
okay. quietly. Sure. And they began to notice the work. Mm-hmm. One day they asked me, I told them I could no longer continue the, the membership. I, I wasn't going to stop. Uh-huh. I wanted to take a break yeah. because finances were not going as the way, the way it should sure. be as a result of our um, COVID and the yeah. pandemic, which yeah. was affecting everyone. Yeah. And I had some other priorities. So I decided sure. that I would not stop creating. I would buy the clay, take it home, mm-hmm. but I would just take, put it on hold. Mm-hmm. And I told them I'd be back in about three months. Okay. I like to work in around or in the environment with others. Yeah. Even if I was not talking to them directly, yeah. that, that whole united energy yeah. of um, artistic spirits was just mm-hmm. really mm-hmm. empowering. Yeah. yeah. So I decided to leave. And um, McKendry, the founder of our Shack, called me and said, you know, we would love to have you exhibit. We love your work. We'd like to have you be a part of, and we'd like to offer you a residency. Oh. And that's just how it happened. Nice. Nice, nice. So for the show, and tell us, Tell us the inspiration around the show, the name, and and, and what are some of the, the inspirations that came through it. I decided that for the show, I was going to introduce and share some of the previous pieces. I had three beautiful pieces that I kept because I knew I would return mm-hmm. to this, and I wanted them to be a presence in my life as a reminder of what I was capable of doing and where I need to go back to. Mm-hmm. Like I said, go far. Yes. Okay? Yes. And so I did not want to forget my past right. history of that experience. Right. So I tried to find a name that I felt was fitting. And I, I decided to embrace the name Nefer Atum. And it's an Egyptian word that means lotus blossom. It means rising, rebirth, regeneration. What inspired me to use that name was for two reasons. One, I did a workshop with Queen Afua many, many years ago mm-hmm. in which she empowered women mm-hmm. through the Egypt, through the, the Egyptian way of life Mm -hmm. and you know I learned about my body and my mind and my spirit and diet and all those things and I was part of an a group we all had different names and my group was called Neferatum and I was inspired by the name because it it, it was about a lotus blossom that grew in the swamp lotus flowers grow in a swamp yeah and there's no light in that murky swamp and somehow they find their way and I believe that's my life that Despite what I've been through, and I've been through some very difficult periods in my life, as have many other people. Mm -hmm. But I always knew that is not all that my life would stand for, and that there is a light, and I am going to, I'm determined to move towards that light. Mm -hmm. And so the word Neferatum was indicative of reminding me of who I am and where I will be. Even if I'm not there in that moment when I'm saying, no problem, mom, man, I know that I will move and I will rise. I just knew that. Sure. That was just a strong belief in my system, in my spirit. Yeah. And so I fumbled around looking for all kinds of names in English words, African words, all kinds of names. But what struck my spirit was the word Neferatum. And it, it, it symbolizes rebirth mm-hmm. and regeneration. And I believe after having not worked in play for so long mm-hmm. and coming back, it was truly an experience of rebirth, not just in physically creating, but in me really empowering myself and finding that life and energy again yeah. to become more yeah. and better. Right, right, right. So I, I understand the, the exhibit was a success. Yes, a wonderful success. So looking at the business side of it, so this was your first exhibit and it was a wonderful success. So tell us more about understanding and kind of getting back into the business of being an artist, because I think that's always a roadblock for artists, yeah. whether whether they can sell work and can be paid for it. So tell us more about that, like how you determine your pricing and, and also just got the word out about the exhibit and, and things of that nature. First of all, with the pricing, my initial desire to have this exhibit was just to share with the world what I'm doing sure. and to get in feedback. And when someone says, well, how much are you going to sell them for? Mm-hmm. That became a concern. And I actually consulted with collectors of art, okay. of African art or Afro-based art, mm-hmm. to get some advice. Mm-hmm. And I decided that I would not go over the top mm-hmm. or go too low yeah. because my years of experience in living of 30 years, whether I was created with my hands or not, was translated in the work. Yeah. And I should be recognized for that. Exactly. My training and my experience in the field also had to be translated in that. Mm-hmm. So I, the, the, the rate that was charged for the fees that I decided to um, settle on was based on that. Okay. And, um, that I, and I thought that was fair and reasonable. Sure. However, I knew and I'm clear that the quality of the work, the time put in the work, 
the process of creating the piece, mm -hmm. I could have, moving forward, elevated the prices sure. in time. Sure. <clears throat> but this was my first experience, and I was more um, excited about the opportunity to share the work and get feedback, honest feedback from people. Yeah. You know, to have people walk in and tell me what they saw, what they felt, yeah. how it touched them. Sure. And, and that was priceless. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. was priceless. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For others to walk in and say, I want this piece now, right now. This, is, mm -hmm. th this speaks to me or mm -hmm. this makes me feel this way. This reminds me of that or this gave me power. This, you know, there are so many things that were said to me. Yeah. And um, it was such an honor and such a privilege. I was humbled beyond tears. You know, uh, to have this opportunity, and yes, moving forward, I am going to continue mm -hmm. in a, in the from the business aspect. Sure. So I am consulting with others who are in the field. Okay. I have been given an invitation to exhibit my work um, in a few galleries. Okay. Um, Good. They they like the type of work or the style of work that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Is the feedback. And they said that that's missing. That's not, yeah. people are not creating that anymore. And right. I think that's really interesting, right? So, yeah, it is. So how would you describe your style? It's old. It's ancient. Uh -huh. um, it's spirit. Yes. Um, it's, yes. it's Afrocentric. It's, it speaks of the roots of what I believe. Sure. And understand that I'm from Jamaica, where we have a diverse culture yeah. of many races. And like everyone who was colonized and been through slavery, you know, sometimes we want to dilute the pride we have in the color of our skin, the shade mm. of our skin, or the texture of our hair, mm. or how big our lips are, or wide our noses are. And, and, and we'll say we are mixed with another culture. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm mm -hmm. beautiful because I have Chinese in me and I have you know, Italian or whatever. And it's almost like we're apologizing for the degree of black, but I've always loved myself. Mm -hmm. um, but that goes back to stories my father told me as a child. But I always had pride in myself and I always wanted to express that beautifully, yeah. not angrily or defiantly or defensively. Yeah. It truly is what's coming from me. Yeah. And so the fact that others can appreciate that yeah. and see the beauty in that, yeah. it's not work that everybody's going to love or relate to. But it doesn't matter to me. It's an expression of myself. And if you can appreciate it and see something in it, then I feel wonderful just knowing that I can share that. Nice, nice. And so I have some wonderful photos of the exhibit and the, um, the exhibition that will be in the show notes and in the blog post that will be on the website. So be sure to check the show notes again, folks, and then also look at the blog for this episode because you'll see the work. And so what I would say is I felt like the work, when you said that you, you a spirit would just come and then you'd see something... I feel like that is the character of each of your pieces. Like as it's as though you, like you said, you, you dug into the earth and did into the clay, and whatever essence was in that the clay, the earth, yeah, came out, came through. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, thank you for that because yes. I didn't know that's what you felt. Yeah. So thank you for that. Because yeah. every every piece has its own face, its own expression, its own energy. Energy, exactly, exactly, exactly. That's how I would how I would describe it. Let me ask you this: what What would you say is a mindset hack that you live your life by, or something that you can imagine that just gets your mind into the mode of hacking itself? Walks, walks. I love to go for walks. Okay, I that's love. A great one. To hug trees. Me too. I love to hug trees. Yeah. I love to talk. Okay. to myself uh -huh. and the energy around me. And I love to express gratitude in those moments. Okay. Um, that is what takes me to that place. I love to look at the sun as it rises or it's just set up there. Mm -hmm. um, nature is my joy. Sure. Yeah. So, so you take a lovely walk to unwind and you take in all those other things. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So... I want to ask you a little bit more about, because you are a woman of many talents, tell us a little bit more about your work as an entrepreneur, because you were a teacher for a long time working, you know, in the public yeah. school system, and then now you are, you work for yourself. You yeah. Know. So now I'm an independent contractor. So sure. initially for um, several years, um, almost 20 years, I was a public school teacher. Yeah. And I taught many levels as an elementary school teacher, a middle school teacher, mm -hmm. specializing in certain subjects, and, and, and specializing in art as an art teacher. Uh -huh. um, 
But I branched off. I decided somewhere along the line, I, I kind of crossed both fields. I was interested in the field of early intervention, which is a state funded um, organization that provided services to children with developmental challenges from birth to three. Okay. And somewhere along the line, I decided I loved it so much. So it was a, a, an environment where I could go in and work with one child at a time and make a difference mm -hmm. in the life of that one child. Mm -hmm. um, nothing is wrong with working with groups of children. I enjoyed that too. Mm -hmm. But the fact that I could go in and work, and I, I had to learn again how to be a teacher on that level mm -hmm. because it was different from a classroom. Yes. I'm in someone's home. Yes. There are variables that are happening in people's homes that is impacting on the child or mm -hmm. the fact that the child has a delay has affected the family or the relationships between their parents. Mm -hmm. There are so many dynamics. Mm -hmm. And in every one of those environments, I have learned something. Mm -hmm. And I've worked with children from all walks of life of every culture you could imagine. Mm -hmm. Right here in New York, mm -hmm. right here in Brooklyn and Queens, sure. which is amazing. But um, working with this in that field with children with autism, I, be, I decided to become an independent contractor, which means that I'm hired by different agencies. Yeah. They retain my services to provide the services to the children. Okay. And um, that has been an expansion in my business. I've done many other things. Sure. <laughs> I, I owned and operated a daycare at one point okay. because I was so um, appalled that uh. children in daycares were not the children with special needs in daycare were not recognized as having special needs yes. they were seen as children who had a problem yeah. or Behavior didn't know how to problems. behave or yeah. was too angry or withdrawn and what's wrong with you and i didn't yeah. like them being told what's wrong with you so i yeah. wanted to make a difference so i actually founded a, a, a daycare center mm -hmm. um in my home a small group family daycare mm -hmm. where i felt i could make a difference mm -hmm. it didn't last too long it lasted a couple of years like maybe seven years okay. but i realized that it was not generating the kind of funding i needed to still take care of all my other expenses and I had to go part-time doing early intervention and the other so I slowly That's closed that yeah. it was a lot yeah. I'm still a sing single parent raising yeah. four children yeah. so it was a lot so I decided I need to just focus sure. so I decided to um, focus on early intervention okay. and do that I like the independent contractual work I'm yeah. not confined to an office but I have to be disciplined yes. I have to organize myself organize yes. my schedule yes. to make sure that the supplies and the materials that I'm working with the children is available mm -hmm. and that my time is managed properly. My billing and paperwork has to be submitted in order for me to get paid. Mm -hmm. So there are many aspects of that that had to be taken care of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm still working on those things. <laughs> Aren't we all? You know, right. as one, one, one person shops, <laughs> right. we got to figure out That's everything. That's it, you got to figure everything out. Exactly, so. exactly. So you, you gave us one story about your father and, and how he kind of empowered you. Can you tell us a little bit more about some of yeah. those stories? Well, the one story that impacted on me, for, you know, my father had a very interesting life. Mm -hmm. um, um, he grew up very poor in the country mm -hmm. and he was born to a mother who had him out of wedlock. Okay. And that was an embarrassment at the time. Sure. So he was given to his aunt who... Um, so was she married? She was married. Okay. She was a school teacher, mm -hmm. uh, a headmistress, they called them in the yes. days. They had the horse and buggies. But, you know, um, so he grew up in that era. Okay. And, but he was poor. And yes. he had to feed the goats by the river. And, mm -hmm. you know, he had to work for his keep mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And he became very empowered and became had his own business. Mm -hmm. He had his own company. Mm -hmm. So I didn't grow up as the stereotype was a poor child in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. My father was successful, he's a successful businessman. Mm -hmm. um, he had seven children mm -hmm. and we grew up comfortable. Okay. Okay. But he taught us that um, the life he led and the profit that he gained from it was not ours to inherit automatically. Mm -hmm. We had to appreciate mm -hmm. what he did and therefore we had to learn to do for ourselves. Okay. So he wasn't giving us everything we wanted just because he had the money to give it to us. We had to earn it. I wanted contact lens. He said, when you have a job, you'll get contact lens. <laughs> you know, it's not because you have the money or I want to wear an outfit to go yeah. to um, a party this weekend. It was three girls. And he said, well, if you want one, make one. So we had to sew our clothes. Okay. We had to go buy the fabric. So sure. we learned at an early age that we had to be creative and to, to achieve the things we wanted. We didn't just put our hands out to get it. Yeah. But the profound story about my dad, why I love myself so much, and my grandfather too, yeah. um, there were two things that they said. Why my father remembered stories of an ancestor who came over to the island as a slave. Mm -hmm. And she was the daughter. He doesn't know the whole story, the whole history of everything that goes back, but he remembers the story that was told to him by his grandmother, his mother, okay. that um, she was the daughter of a 
king or chief in Africa. Mm -hmm. And she was a slave here. Mm -hmm. And some of the rituals and things that was done was passed from her to his mother Got it. and maybe to him. Got it. But he was proud to say that he was of a bloodline of, even though he was from slaves, he's Royal. not from slaves. Yes. He came before that. Yes. And so I always knew that somewhere in my life that I had to know more about that. That is something to be proud of. Yeah. So little me, five foot tall, would walk on the street with my head up and my back straight like I was a queen yeah. all the time, hands yeah. down, with everything else that was going on. Yeah. So much so that my brother called me Bandulu. He didn't know where the name came from, <laughs> but that was his nickname for me. Okay. I was Bandulu because I had such a pride uh -huh. in myself and my hair. Yeah. You know, I remember my in those days, my hair was full and thick yeah. and, and it was hard to comb yeah. according to what they consider Everybody. good hair and bad hair. Yeah. So yeah. my mother would, she said it was so hard. It was more than my sister's. And so she would get the iron comb straight with it. the grease and straighten yeah. it. And I never forget my grandfather. I was coming from the neighbor next door. Uh -huh across back to my house. She had just finished straightening my hair with my mom. And he said, why did you burn that child's hair? How dare you burn our beauty? And for the first oh, time, he you. felt that my hair was so beautiful. Why yeah. did you tamper with it and alter it? Yeah. And here I was as this little dark child in Jamaica, mm -hmm. not loving myself the way that I should have, yeah. trying to be proud of that part that my father told me, but so many other things around was telling me that I should not believe that I'm beautiful. Sure. And here comes my grandfather saying, how dare you alter the beautiful texture of her hair by burning it with an iron comb. Mm -hmm. I was like, wow, I'm really beautiful. So I've yeah. always had pride in my texture of my hair, the color of my skin, and my family's diverse. We're mixed with all kinds of things, yeah. cultures and race. There's nothing wrong with that. We yeah. love that. Yeah. But this is who I am, and mm -hmm. this is what I'm proud of. Mm -hmm. And so my whole life and the expression of who I am is based on that. I'm not doing it to be militant. It's what's just coming out of me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's flowing naturally, like a river or the ocean. Right. It's so awesome that your father and your grandfather yeah. were able to, to give you yeah. that. That's yeah. that's great. Okay, yeah. so let me ask you this to kind of we've gotten into your business side, your creative side. Let's talk about in your quiet time. Besides walking, are you a watcher, a reader, or a listener? I like to listen. Okay. But I was a, a bookworm. Okay. As a child, I was a bookworm. Okay. I was a child who um, crawled on the bed with a flashlight to read when I was told to go to bed and would uh -huh. read until the sun came up and then go to school. Okay. Um, I love to read. I love books. Yeah. Um, so what are some of your more favorite reads? I love books about other dimensions, spirituality, mm. things like that. I love, as a child, um, as a child, I didn't understand why people cried when people died. I just felt that they went somewhere else. I just yeah. knew in my spirit. So I, I cried because they cried. Yeah. I cried because they were sad, but yeah. I didn't cry because of loss. Of loss. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, yes. So I always want to know more. I, I remember as a child that I used to astral travel. Mm -hmm. as a child mm -hmm. and or in a mm -hmm. semi awake state mm -hmm. I could do that mm -hmm. didn't know what that meant mm -hmm. or or could have premonitions or see things or look at someone and feel things mm -hmm. but it, it was laughed at it was made fun of mm -hmm. so it was mm -hmm. suppressed and I'm not even sure if it still exists anymore in me yeah. or even it has not been pulled out but as a child mm -hmm. that's how I was I was considered different from mm -hmm. my siblings and they teased me mm -hmm. they loved me but they teased me it sure. was just funny because why are you so weird yeah. everybody else is you know, you're doing all of this stuff and seeing all this stuff and ha <laughs> it was a joke. Yeah. So I pulled more into myself. Ah. Um, I don't read as much now. I listen to audios a lot more now yeah. Yeah. only because of time. Sure. Um, I have been given books to read and I haven't had the opportunity to read them even though I want to read them. Okay. But I love to um, read. I love to swim in my quiet time. Okay. I oh, love, right. Yeah. I love yeah, the water. True. And yeah. anywhere I am, I'll go in the water. I don't care if it's a dirty water at Coney Island. I'm oh. going in the water. I just feel such a connection to the yeah. ocean. Yeah. And so um, it empowers me and it gives me energy. Got it. Got it. So what is your favorite all-time book then, if you can even choose one? I don't know if there's a favorite all-time book. I could say um, I was fascinated with the Bible because of the stories, because I had ah, so many questions about it. Okay. I didn't necessarily believe everything I read, yeah. but it had so many stories that was interesting, that made sense, and did make sense. Yeah. And, and, and people would say, well, you don't question what's in the book. 
but I want to question everything. <laughs> so that was um, very interesting. But what's my favorite book? My current, there was a phase where I went through um, Conversations with God. Okay. Um, by Neil Do um, Welsh, mm -hmm. Donald Walsh. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed listening to um, audios and reading books. Um, what's the name of the person? Abraham Hicks. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Abraham the Hicks. The Secret. The Secret. Mm -hmm. um, but beyond that, I mean, yeah. and I've been listening to him for like 20 years, or her. Yeah. Um, him, her. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, so books like that, yeah. I find interesting because yeah. I believe that a part of my spirit is searching for answers. Yeah. That's not obvious in the literal. Yeah. And, you know, I'll go to Barclays or any store and I'll stand in that, that area with those kinds of new wave books yeah. and I'll just stand and I might turn around a circle like a crazy person and go there and there's and a book there's one for you. and that's the book for me. Yeah. So the fun is in discovering new books yeah. and books that, you know, I, I love to study about nutrition and the body and how that works and yeah. what foods we should eat okay. and not eat. So I spend a lot of time doing that. Okay. Okay. Just how food impacts on our body and our spirit. Yeah. Which yeah. is, yeah. it's, I mean, food is everything. Food is everything. Yeah. If you can't eat, if you don't eat the right thing, it, yeah. it makes everything. It changes everything. It changes everything. Okay. So, Beverly, this has been so wonderful. Thank you. I could talk to you for hours, but I know that you you have the rest of your afternoon and yes. it's getting ready for the week and everything. Mm -hmm. But thank you so much for spending this time with me. It's I been very a pleasure. much appreciate it. Yes, yes, yes. So, do you have any last words for our listeners today? I'd like to acknowledge my sons and daughters. Okay. My firstborn is Seku. Okay. Um, he was in Bringing the Noise, Bringing the Funk as a tap dancer. Oh, okay. And continues to live in a creative process. Uh -huh. My second son is Adichike. He was on So You Think You Can Dance and is now in power. Okay. Um, so he, they, they all started. My daughter is Zakia, my only daughter who was born in the middle of the day when sun shone. That's Zakia. And, <laughs> and my son, and she's also a dancer and a performer and has moved on to other things in her life, like psychology uh -huh. and hair. She's a stylist. Okay. And my youngest son, Shakir, who I think is such a powerful, powerful spirit who heals through his words Aww. and through the things that he does. And to my grandchildren, Star, Ilewa, King, Seku, and Shakir, I send you my love. I acknowledge my mom and my family, and I'm just so grateful to have you all in my life. Wonderful. Those are wonderful last words. Wonderful. All right, listeners, this has been another episode of Local Citizens. As always, you can catch new episodes each and every Tuesday at www.localcitizenspod.com and wherever you get your podcasts, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Audible, Amazon Music, Stitcher, you get the idea. Listen up. And please share, subscribe, ask a question, recommend a guest. We love to hear from you. So until next time, bye for now.